Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and being a steward of the land. Nose Jammer contains vanillin and other natural aromatic compounds that have the ability to effectively jam an animal's sense of smell. Just like an overly bright light can wash out a photographic image, Nose Jammer overwhelms the olfactory system and overpowers an animal's ability to detect and track human scent. Hunting in the wrong wind? Jam them with Nose Jammer. Welcome to Midwest Hunting Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. Uh, the other dumbass, Tim, is on sabbatical today, so special assignment as we've been talking. But uh, we are honored to be here at the Rathbun Fish Hatchery, uh, located just out of uh, Rathbun, Iowa. And I'm joined by Chris. Chris, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah. So I'm Chris Klaus. Uh, I'm the hatchery manager at Rathbun. I've been here for 21 years, and I've been doing fish culture for about 35 years. Um, I got my education at Kansas State University, and then I got a master's at Iowa State University in fish culture. I worked for Idaho Fish and Game for a year, uh, Kansas Wildlife and Parks for nine years, and then I've been here for 21 years. I did my uh, research in North Dakota at the National Fish Hatcheries Uh, focusing on walleye culture and so I've pretty much been involved with walleye culture for a while now and uh, really enjoy my job Uh, I've got a farm background and it fits right into this line of work where where's home where's uh, where do you call home I grew up down in Kingman Kansas which is uh, south central Kansas primarily uh, uh, wheat and beef cattle area Uh, there's quite a few oil wells around there and uh, we raised hogs, had a dairy, um, had beef cattle. My dad uh, believed in doing a lot of different things, and so we were always busy. There was eight of us kids, and we were, learned to work on the farm. Yeah, so yeah, that's that. You got a whole gang. He, he had a whole crew there to run yeah. the farm, right? So yeah, so my brother has really grown the farm. It's much larger now, and and he has a son farming with him. So. Um, I guess we are on our fourth generation of Kansas farmers. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. What a great uh, history. Yeah, maybe five. We, um, we're going to talk walleyes today, but before we get into walleyes, you know, if, if, folks, if you haven't ever been to the, the hatchery here, um, the fishery, it's just an amazing place. So uh, can you talk a little bit about the history, where it came from, when, did, when it was built, and, uh, you know, what it might look like down the road? Yeah, uh, so... Uh, back in the day, uh, the Iowa Conservation Commission wanted to build a new fish hatchery, and so Rathbun Lake turns 50 years old this year, and so it would have been 1971, I think, does that sound right, when they dedicated Lake Rathbun, and so as they were building this lake, there was local support for putting a fish hatchery below the dam at the lake and so uh, working together they put an 18 inch pipeline in the tower uh, for future expansion when they built that concrete tower out in the lake and then uh, it was a few years later the Iowa Conservation Commission at that time started collecting money to build this facility and the way this place was funded is they sold what were called hatchery stamps which was an actual stamp that you affixed to your fishing license. And so every uh, purchaser of a fishing license in Iowa at that time was buying a hatchery stamp for, I want to say, three, four, five years until they gathered up enough money, and I think the stamp cost $2, uh, which probably seemed like a lot of money at that time. Yeah. Um, but uh, they built this facility. It was, uh, at that time, the highest technology out there. Uh, they didn't really skimp Uh, they built a nice facility and we've tried to keep it that way Um, it's probably if you were to build this facility today 
I would say maybe 80 to $100 million might catch it. Um, it it's uh, first time I've been here. It's, uh, per, first of all, quite a little bit of acreage here. Mm -hmm. And then uh, infrastructure is just huge. Yeah. Well, you know, I've heard people say that you can't uh, – you can't make fish and wildlife through bricks and mortar, but that's not necessarily true with fish hatcheries. Um, fish hatcheries produce a product, and it's a very measurable product that we can put out there for fishermen to, to take advantage and, and use. And so our customers are the fishermen of Iowa. Uh, we have a lot of questions like, do you sell fish? And we don't sell fish. Um, our fish get stocked into places where you have to have a public you have to have a fishing license to fish there. And so we don't go to private ponds. Um, we stock really any public waters in Iowa. And we work with county conservation boards, uh, cities. Um, we stock some rivers. There's quite a few resources in Iowa that we're, we're involved with. Yeah, what a huge advantage for the state. and. Uh yeah, someone was thinking back in the 70s. Uh, oh, yeah. Very futuristic vision there. Yeah, and, you know, it seems like you'd get a lot of water through an 18-inch pipeline, but uh, we could use more. Oh, man. <laughs> That's a, there's a lot of water, a lot of water. Uh, Randy was talking to us about the, the in-feed house out there with the screen. He got a screen, mm -hmm. screen to kind of clean the water, but he said the biggest thing was to keep fish out, right? Right, to, to, right. To manage the fish. But speaking of fish, I mean, we're really focusing on, this episode's focusing on walleye, and we've spent a lot of time this morning um, out on the floor, but can you, can you talk us through what's, um, you know, what's the process of, you know, you know, getting the, getting the wall up from, really from mom to, to fingerling to growing it and then putting it in these lakes? What, what's that process look like? Well, uh, to start with, you have to have some brood fish, okay? And so we have lakes around the state that we've identified as our brood fish lakes. And Lake Rathbun is one of them, uh, Storm Lake, uh, Spirit Lake, Clear Lake. Um, make sure I'm not missing anybody, but generally our larger lakes uh, have provided these brood fish over the years. And... Uh, so what that involves is the natural reproduction cycle for a walleye is to, <clears throat> when the water temperature gets around 48 degrees Fahrenheit, which in most places is, you know, first part of April in Iowa. Uh, it depends, sometimes the northern state, the northern parts of the state, it's later than that. Um, depends on the weather in the spring. And also it's affected by day length. And so the length of day affects that female's readiness to spawn and so <clears throat> on Lake Rathbun what happens is those fish generally start moving towards the dam they're looking for a rocky substrate to do their spawning on and we set gill nets along the face of the dam and we catch those adults as they're coming in to spawn and we check the gill nets twice a night we will run nets until we catch enough brood fish to uh, get enough fry for us to stock our requests or fulfill our requests. Um, normally for us, we re receive a request from our management biologist for about 80 million fry. 80 million? Yeah. Oh, man. So, you know, somewhere in there, 70 to 80 million. It varies from year to year. Um, and so the thing to remember about that is it takes quite a few more million than that to, to get to 70 million fry. So we get about a 75% hatch, generally speaking, on our eggs that we collect from wild broodfish. Um, we fertilize the eggs with wild males, and it takes about two weeks on the incubator for those fry to hatch. And those fry are very small, uh, nine millimeters or about a quarter to three-eighths inch when they, they hatch, and they're, they're translucent. Um, so they're very fragile. And they're also uh, very attractive to other fish species to eat them when we stock them. And people ask, well, why don't you raise them to a bigger size? Well, it takes space and it takes money and facilities to raise them to a larger size. Uh, so we have uh, facilities, 10 acres of, of ponds where we can grow fish to one and a half inches. But we can't do 80 million of them that way. 
So normally we'll stock uh, the 10 ponds that we have with about 75,000 to maybe 100,000 fry per acre. It depends on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and uh, we get about, you know, 75% return. So, you know, we're getting 500, 600,000 inch and a half fingerlings out of those. And then out of that, we'll bring around 350,000 into our tank room. Okay, so when we're growing them in the ponds, we call that phase one. And out there, they're just feeding on uh, zooplankton, benthic invertebrate uh, insects. Um, and so they're just really acting like a normal wild walleye. Only thing is, there's no predators out there to eat. And them. again, the size of these are, are very small. Very small when they start, but they're big enough to eat these zooplankton and ins insects. I'm telling you about. Okay. Okay. And so we grow them out there for about 35 days, and then it's natural for a walleye at about 35 to 40 days of age to switch over to eating fish. And Mother Nature set that up so that, you know, prey fish are spawning earlier, or excuse me, right after the walleye so that their little fry are available for these walleye to come in and eat. Well, we don't have that here at the hatchery, so we've got to convert them onto a dry diet, a pelleted feed. So we bring them into our tank room, we call that phase two, and really what the tank room is about is training. It's a, a feed training stage. Hmm. And so these fish, they have a desire to, to strike a moving <laughs> object uh, like another fish, and so we've got to offer them feed that they want to eat for one thing and we have to keep that feed in front of them and so it's a very intensive part of our our program where we take a lot of manpower and effort to get these fish on feed and uh, so out of that 350,000 fish that we bring into the tank room we try and get a return of around 250 to 225,000 four inch fingerlings okay and so in that process we give them different feeds we we sort them by size, um, and we treat them for any diseases that might occur during that, that phase of culture. Um, so that's the part that um, we went over this morning. And uh, Yeah, just a qu couple quick questions. So sure. going back to the brood fish, sure. um, you, you, you're throwing some big numbers around 80 million fries or 100 million fries. Um, how many eggs from a brood fish? Uh, so generally speaking, uh, eggs are 125,000 per quart. And so when we get a really big brood fish, we can get three to four quarts of eggs right. out of that fish. So hundreds of thousands, two to three hundred, four hundred thousand eggs. Right. Think of it this way. Established in 1934, Pete and Shorty's is located on Main Street, Clarksville, Iowa. Pete and Shorty's is famous for their half-pound burgers, hand-breaded tenderloins, and homemade pizza. The beer is always cold, and the Bloody Marys are the best in town. Stop in and tell Mike and Amy that the two dumbasses sent you. Um, while I don't give any parental care to their offspring, okay, they just lay the eggs and swim away, and it's like, good luck, I hope you make it. Uh, so in the wild, you know, at least in Iowa, the survival, if they just spawned in the wild, would not be very high. Um, the hatch rate would be very low, and the survival would be very low. So by using the hatchery to improve that situation and take away some predators, um, you can at least get some fry to stop. It's a numbers, numbers game. Yeah, um, yeah, so. and so... Um, you might compare it to insects almost. Yeah. Like they lay a bunch of eggs and they leave. Good yeah. luck. Yeah. And so we're kind of filling that little gap where we try and give them some care. And and, and just clarification is um, I think you said phase two was when you bring them in the tanks inside. Mm -hmm. And that's what we, the dark room, that's that's what we were looking at this morning where we were you were getting ready to transfer them uh, from right. inside to outside. Yes. So that's where you're, Big one is training them to eat food, mm -hmm. sounds like, yeah. and then uh, getting some growth out of them right? and, um, and, and treating them for any uh, illness or diseases. Right, so that's a big part of our job okay. is just every day we're, we're looking uh, what's going on. And so our water is just raw water. It's not treated in any way. It's not chlorinated. It's just fresh water out of the lake. And so since there's this big fish, wild fish population out there, uh, you get 
you know, parasites coming in off those fish. Um, you also get bacteria coming in. Just It's just natural in the water that you would have bacteria, and so then we have bacterial infections in our fish. Um, it's not super common, but um, we're definitely aware of it, and we stay on top of it. So okay. that's a big part of our job. Okay. Um, so you asked a question about broodfish. Yep. Um, those numbers do seem staggering when you talk about 80 million and 100 million. Yeah. And so somebody might say, well, how many fish are you, do you capture and uh, what percentage of the population might that be? So on Lake Rathbun, it's not unusual for us to capture 500 females and the males are almost always ready to go. Okay, they, they are providing the semen just, you know, all the time. In the springtime, they're ready. The females, not all those females that we capture are ready to go the day we capture them. And so um, they don't ovulate, you know, just the second you catch them. So sometimes we have to hold them for a day or two. Um, and so on Lake Rathbun, if you think about the entire population of large fish, we might catch, it depends on the year and what kind of catch rate we have, we might catch 25% of the population and bring them through the hatchery. And so we clip the tails on these brood fish as we're spawning them. And so we recognize that fish from year to year. And we also insert a, a passive integrated transponder, a pit tag. It looks like a little capsule, a little black pill is what it looks like. And so we can run the uh, pit tag reader over these fish, and it'll say this fish was captured last year on such such date. We have that set up in an Excel file, and we have the length of the fish. And we know that these fish survive the spawning process because we capture them repeatedly. You know, and we see fish that have come in here five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. Um, so um, it's a... It's an important resource, um, but we're also getting eggs in here from Storm Lake. Like they've got a really strong population right now and they provided us a lot of eggs this year. Um, <clears throat> and so historically we've got eggs from Clear Lake in the past. Their population's down a little bit right now, so we're not receiving any eggs from them at this time. Um, so that kind of gives you some idea of the numbers of fish we're talking about. And it's a lot, of, it's very interesting. And for a fisherman, it's super cool, super fun. And you catch other fish species, too, with those gill nets. We try and uh, make our gill nets so they don't catch every single fish. Uh, so the bar in the gill nets is large enough that a small fish can swim through it. But large fish get their heads caught in there, and then they try and back out, and they're caught by their gills. I mean, it's got to be a, a great source of data from year to year when you're oh, yeah. catching the same fish that have been tagged. So you've got... You know, here's what they were at this stage, and here's what they are now. And what, I mean, just curious from a fisherman standpoint, what's the biggest one that you that you remember catching? Uh, we've had a 13 and a half in here before, you oh, know, and she yeah. was just full of eggs. I mean, her belly was, you know, just about to burst. Man. Um, so I want to mention one more time, those big females, their egg quality is just as high as a young, small female. So, um, just to dispel any rumors, um, if you return a big female, there's a real good chance that we'll take eggs from her next spring. So, I want to encourage people catch and release, keep some of the smaller fish to eat. Those big females, those big trophy females, sure, it's fine to put one on the wall, but if you're really into them, I mean, you could catch five really big fish, and they're a significant resource for us. Yeah, good. That's good. That's good. Uh, good watch out. Um, okay, so we we kind of left the phase. I think in phase two with the dark room, and you got they're they're now on hopefully food. feeding on yes. food and not each other, right? Because right? you're telling me these are can't. I mean, they're, they'll eat each other very easy. Yes, throughout their whole life. Yeah. 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 Um, so what's next? So now you've got them, and they're how big at phase two? Four inches. Four inches. At the end of phase two. They're four-inch fish. And so um, that's normally around the 4th of July. We've got them up to the four inches. Um, and so now the next phase is phase three, and that's really our feed-out period. 
And so at that phase, we were in the outdoor circulating tanks. Um, we're really pushing feed to them. And the interesting thing about fish, uh, at least from an agriculture point of view, is their food conversion is much higher than any other animal. Uh, so if we give them 1.2 pounds of feed, we can expect a pound of gain. Really? Okay. So I'll give you some reference, like uh, broilers are maybe 2.5 pounds of feed to one pound of gain. Uh, hogs are, I don't know the latest, but probably three and a half to four pounds of feed to one pound of gain. And beef uh, is like six pounds of feed to one pound of gain. So they're super efficient as far as growing yes. um, for yeah. the, the food that they eat. And we, you know, we again, we, you, you kind of walk me through some of the food uh, mm -hmm. phases that uh, you feed them. So that'll be injected in the episode here. But can you talk about, maybe now's a good time to talk about the, the different um, kind of feed that you, you do feed these walleyes? Yeah, so f the, the walleyes are very predatorial fish. And so we have to provide them something that's very high in protein. And so um, we feed a, a feed that's called walleye grower um, that we've worked a diet up through just some experimentation that's about 48% protein. And most of that protein in that feed is coming from fish meal. Fish meal comes from the ocean. So if someone were to criticize what we're doing, um, if you're really into environmental stuff, you know that the oceans are having a hard time. Um, and so that fish meal is being harvested uh, from the ocean to create a feed to feed to some predatory fish. So I don't know. I don't feel too bad about it. Um, but it's something to think about and be aware of. Um, now, we graduate them from what we call one millimeter feed to a two millimeter feed to a three and eventually a four millimeter feed. And to give you some reference, a four millimeter feed is, you know, it's, it's not as much as a quarter inch, but it's getting to be a larger pellet. And uh, these pellets sink. And uh, <clears throat> so we feed with automatic feeders. Um, we've improved the technology on that a lot uh, since I've been here. Um, we're using a PLC that we can tell how many fish are in each tank and then that PLC sends a s signal to the feeder and says okay I need you to feed this many times a day and uh, this is how long you need to feed to get this dose out and so we think of it or call it a dose but it might be called a feeding event and so uh, in phase three these fish are we've got a program since they're primarily a nighttime feeder that most of our feeding is occurring at night, but we don't control the lighting out in phase three. So, you know, it's just whatever the day length is. Um, so we'll take the fish from four inches to a minimum of eight inches by the first of October. And, um, <clears throat> you know, some years we're very successful when we get them up to 10. Some of the fish will be 12 inches when we're stocking them out of here. Uh, we try and not handle the fish until the water temperature drops below 65 degrees and Fahrenheit in the fall. The fish just handle better at cooler water temperatures. Um, so most of the time here, that's about the middle of October when we start harvest. Um, so we go all over the state with phase three fish, but Rathman does get a lot of these fish back to it, uh, normally around 80,000, get stocked right back into Rathman. Um, <clears throat> but we go to Spirit Lake, uh, West Okaboji, East Okaboji, Clear Lake, uh, Brushy Creek Lake, Big Creek, uh, you know, McBride. I can just go on. Yeah, yeah. Pleasant Creek Lake, Three Mile, 12 Mile. Yeah, I think this morning when we arrived, you were loading up a truck to go to Spirit Lake, right? And Yes, those were, were small walleye, and they were going to be stocked in rivers in northwest Iowa. Yeah, yeah. So, so you guys were driving the truck halfway, and they were going to come with another truck and swap and, yes. and, and go back. So, wow, that's interesting. Iowa-Missouri Hybrids has been a family-owned business since the 1930s. Located in historic Keosauqua, Iowa, Aaron and his team are a one-stop shop for farmers, hunters, and landowners. For your conservation program, CRP, food plots, and all planting needs, give Aaron at IMH a call and tell him the two dumbasses sent you. Yeah, now 
there's other hatcheries in the state. I should mention that. Um, so we have a trout program, and there's three trout hatcheries in the northeast corner of the state, um, uh, Decorah, Manchester, and Big Spring. And then uh, Spirit Lake is also a, a cool water hatchery, and they primarily focus on walleye and muskie and northern, I guess, production. And so they're also a very old facility, and they're getting renovated this year. So oh, good. it's a nice upgrade. Yeah, good. Good. Um, so these fish are in outside in phase three, mm -hmm. and they're starting four inches. You're trying to get them up to at least eight and hopefully bigger than that. You mm -hmm. said maybe up to 10 or 12. Um, how much time is that? So I'm so if we get them out there the 4th of July, uh, let's see, July, August, September, October, you know, you basically take them up there in three months uh, from four to eight inches. You know, in our water temperature, okay, fish are unique. Okay, they are the same temperature as whatever the water temperature is. So our water temperature can get up to 90 degrees, and that can be lethal to walleye. Um, so <clears throat> we take advantage right now today it's 74 degrees, which is ideal temperature for growing walleye. So we take advantage of those temperatures, and that's what allows us to get to fish to a larger size because they become more aggressive. As the water temperature warms, they'll eat more. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, when you get that kind of food conversion, uh, if we put 25,000 fish in one of those circulating tanks and we get them to 10 inches, let's say, they'll be three to the pound. So, you know, even if you lost a few of them, you can have 8,000 pounds of fish in that one tank. Yeah. And you better make sure everything's working. The water cannot shut off. When you get 8,000 pounds of fish in a small area. Got to keep it uh, flowing and cool. Oxygenated. And, and oxygenated. Everything. You're right. actually adding oxygen to the water out there. I think Randy was yep. was showing us that system yep. out there. So yep. it's amazing. It's a it's a process. It's agriculture, right? You're yeah, you gotta, you've got to stay on top of the job. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, now it's October or middle of October, and these fish are ready to be um, transported. So how are they? stocked are they all truck do we do any airplanes or anything like that it's all trucking all trucking um all of our employees here have class bc deals uh, so we have three fish stocking trucks um they're all uh, over a thousand gallons so you have to have a tanker endorsement with air brakes and we haul lots of times on fridays we'll take a break it just depends what's going on that week. You know, we might do short trips on Fridays, but Monday through Friday, we're hauling. We try not haul on weekends, um, but we do have staff usually here every weekend. And so we have a rotating uh, summer schedule, and as long as we have fish on the facility, somebody's working. Wow. Um, and, and you said that, you know, this is staffed 724, too, on the weekends. The fish still need to eat and, you know, the, the oxygen testing needs to be done and yada yada so you've got staff here every day of the week pretty much now in the winter time things can slow down a little bit um, so that's the time of year we do our maintenance and work on our fish nets and get prepared for the next year you know so and also lots of employees take their vacation in the winter times yeah yeah, a little slower time there. Let's go back a little bit, Chris. Um, you know, we kind of dabbled and touched on uh, diseases. And, uh, you know, we don't need to talk about all of them, but you know, I'm sure there's a top three or four or five that you, that you have to deal with. Um, can, you, can you educate me on sure. what some of those things that you're trying to treat these fish with? Well, the number one parasitic disease is ick. And uh, so the scientific name is Ichthyopterius multiflis. But if you've ever had a home aquarium, <laughs> you, you've dealt with ick. And you can see why they call it ick, because <laughs> who can pronounce that besides you, right? <laughs> that's crazy. Well, um, so it's a protozoan parasite that's common in freshwater, all right? And if you have an aquarium at home, uh, and if you have it very long, you're probably going to see ick in your aquarium, and it looks like little salt uh, sprinkled on the outside of your fish, little white bumps. And so these little ick, they graze on the exterior of the fish and they can really reproduce rapidly. And so um, controlling them is a very important part of our process and we do what's called crop scouting. And so we sacrifice five fish out of each tank once a week 
and we look for this parasite. And while we're looking for that parasite, we're looking for any other disease issues that might be coming up. And uh, if there is a disease issue with that, we treat it with, uh, with a chemical that's legal for its use. Um, and so we have to dose the water that's in the pond or tank and uh, take care of the parasite that way. Uh, the one that you, another parasite that we have is Chylodinella, which is also a protozoan. Um, we treat with that par parasite with salt. Um, we'll use a half a percent salt uh, put into the pond. And so we'll shut the water off and create basically like a big bathtub. And then we add enough pounds of salt to create a, a salty environment, and that'll knock that parasite off. Hmm. Um, now, on the bacterial side of things, uh, our most common or bacteria problem would be columnaris, uh, which is a Flavobacterium columnari. And uh, so it's a, a soil pathogen, and it's ubiquitous throughout the environment. It's found in fresh water or found in soils. Uh, but when fish are confined in a tight area, uh, it can attack them, and it generally creates um, a saddle on their back. It, it almost looks like a, a little white saddle, or sometimes it'll be a, a cottony-looking uh, stuff coming out of their mouth. Huh. And uh, fish are very susceptible to that, and, like, if you handle them too much, you stress them out, you chase them around the tank with a dip net, you electrofish them, you net them, anything you do to them it's like all those handlings uh, add up and so <clears throat> I have quite a bit of experience handling fish and like some fish handle it better than others um, so like let's just say you're at a fishing tournament and there's a weigh-in and the fish were caught with a hook and line and then they were hauled around in a fish tank on the boat for all day and then they're dipped out of the fish tank and put in a plastic bag, and then they're put on a scale. and then So you don't see the mortality maybe that day. Uh, and so people wonder why we you know, care about this or why we regulate some fishing tournaments. And um, There's a delayed mortality that occurs that you might feel all good that, oh, I won the tournament and I turned my fish loose and they were all live, but... The story's not so good the as time goes on. It depends. It yeah. depends on you know, a lot of things. Like water temperature is a big factor in this. And so, you know, I just have a lot of experience. If we want to keep fish alive around the fish hatchery, we reduce handling and uh, chasing. And, you know, the more you mess with them, the more more problems they're going to have. Yeah, that makes sense. There's a couple things as we were you were showing me the uh, – the place that uh, kind of caught my ear and one was I mean you guys are you guys are very disciplined in the data that you're collecting and and cross-referencing that with the cost and you know exactly what the cost is of a you know to to get this many uh, small fish and then four inch fish and eight um, share that with our audience real quick so uh, typically if you get a 10 inch or a 12 inch uh, walleye that you're going to populate into a lake or stream somewhere in Iowa what's the cost of that fish roughly well for us uh, you know it's not the same everywhere we keep track of everything uh, except for the capital expense of having this building okay so we include man hours uh, trucking um, any fuel feed chemicals uh, we don't we don't get charged for our water thank God because we use a lot of it. Um, <clears throat> so for us to raise a 10-inch walleye is probably going to be $1.25. Um, and so when you think about the value of those walleye as they go along, they get very valuable, especially when they become part of your broodfish population because that's what you're using to, uh, you know, turn into your next generation of fish. So... Let's just imagine the value of an 18-inch walleye in Lake Rathbun. Well, if it cost me $1.10 to get it to 10 inches or $1.25 to get it to 10 inches, so maybe the next year it's, say, 13 inches, and it gets harvested. Well, 
its value wasn't very great yet. But by the time it gets to 18 inches and then 26 inches and 28 inches, its value is is a lot. And, uh, you know, people don't really think about that when they're harvesting fish. We're looking at a little different point of view. Um, what it take to get that 10-inch fish to a 26-inch fish yeah. it takes a lot of years. And so you got to have a lot of fish out there. Um, and so you see some places where, you know, it's more like a put-and-take fishery um, where we put out a 10-inch fish and people are harvesting it. Um, and they're happy. Well, that's okay with me. You know, they're, they're taking home $5 worth of fish if they took five fish. Uh, but I'd lot rather see them wait for a couple of years and, and get something a little better. Uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, I just found that really interesting just coming from a business background. And you guys, I mean, you're basically farming. Mm -hmm. you're, you're farming fish, and you got it down to a science and a, and a number, which is incredible. Um, you know, another way of looking at this, a different, little different question is, you know, by the time you get X number of eggs and by the time you're stocking these fish, what what percentage is, is that? Well, I don't know right off the top of my head, but I can tell you by phase. Okay. Okay, so from egg collection to hatching, we lose about 25%. Okay, so we get a 75% hatch. And then from, for phase one, we expect to get about a 90% return. Um, it's very normal. Uh, phase two, where we're training them to take feed, we get 65 to 75% return. And then phase three, where they're on feed and we're growing them out, we expect a 90% return. So if you add all those losses together, um, it's probably somewhere around 50%, I would guess. Half, half, of, uh, half of what you're starting with um, gets stocked, yeah. basically. Yeah. Which seems to be, I mean, certainly better than nature yes. by far, right? Like yeah. 100 fold, probably. Well, the thing about nature is Mother Nature, you know, it's hard to predict what the weather's going to be, right, or what the year's going to be like. And some of the best walleye populations are created by stocking fry, okay, when you have good conditions for a fry stocking um, and you have high survival of those fry, then it creates a really strong year class. And <clears throat> those year classes are the ones where people can really go fishing, <laughs> you know, and especially if you're mobile and you're like, oh, I hear the fishing's awesome at such and such lake. And they go and they get their five walleye because the population is extremely high. Um, and that year class will continue to provide that kind of fishing for a while as long as the harvest isn't too great. Hmm. Um, so we look at the fish that we produce more as a, a sustenance or a sustaining population. And for those really boom year classes where it's like big, big numbers, um, those mostly come from fry stockings. Awesome. We've talked a lot about walleye here. Is there anything that we've missed? Anything that you want to share with our audience before we call it an episode? Um, well, I love walleye. I based my whole career around them. And, uh, but I love to fish for a lot of other species too. Um, so there's some really great fishing that we have here in Iowa. And I would encourage people not to just get tunnel vision going after one thing. And, you know go for other species every now and then because there's a lot of good fish to eat and there's a lot of fun fish to catch. Uh, so, you know, I guess that I'm a big walleye guy and I love walleye, but I would encourage people to sample some of the other things we have. Yeah, we talked to Darcy on uh, catfish uh, today too. So, um, yeah, interesting, very yeah. interesting. Well, let me thank you very much for... Thanks, Joel the hospitality and showing us around what a great facility you guys provide tours or for the general public if people wanted to visit right uh so july 31st is the 50 year anniversary celebration for rathman lake and we're going to be open that saturday uh, generally speaking we have a self-guided tour monday through friday uh, 8 a.m to 4 p.m uh, for larger groups if they call ahead we'll give a guided tour um yeah, but that weekend the one weekend we are going to be available and give guided tours will be uh that that july 31st july 31st so yeah. we'll we'll try to get this episode um out before that to give people uh, a yeah. little heads up on it and i would just encourage our audience if you're in this area it's uh, it 
it, it's it's amazing is what it is it's a great facility very knowledgeable everybody we met that were here were very hospital and uh very friendly to us and you guys run a great show so well, again, thank you thank you so much thanks a lot I appreciate and uh it. we'll put a wrap on the episode here and uh you know be safe have fun and get outdoors thanks for watching striped bass fingerlings and they're known as wipers hybrid striped bass um, I've heard them called different names palmetto bass sunshine bass uh, but these are the fish that are very abundant in Rathlin and we started out stocking fingerlings in here I suppose it's been eight years ago now and they're a voracious predator on gizzard shad and they're pretty easy to raise. Uh, so the way we raise these fish is we generally have a trade uh, going with another state that raises hybrid striped bass. So it's a cross between a white bass and a striped bass. And so striped bass are the ocean going variety of, of uh, fish that can be crossed with white bass, which is native to Iowa. And so these fish are sterile uh, once they're released, because they're a hybrid. They will try and spawn, but they're not successful. And so uh, these fish are really easy for us to grow, and uh, they create some very exciting fisheries around the state. And if you ever catch one, you'll know what I'm talking about. They're also fast. <laughs> shape than walleye. Um, but they get big. These fish can get up to, I think state record is 28 pounds. And they are aggressive. When you hook one, you can about rip your pole out of the boat. Um, so it's a fun fish. They're not as good to eat as walleye. But if you learn how to fillet them, they are still very good to eat. So some walleye fishermen aren't crazy about them because they see them as a direct competitor with walleye. Like uh, Sailorville's got a really good population, Red Rock, uh, Rathbun, Coralville, uh, McBride. Probably missing some, but there's some really good fishing for them. And the only way that they can repopulate then is through a hatchery. They're sterile. They can't yeah. reproduce out in nature. Yes. Interesting. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.